Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Foltz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans-style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting. And the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting. Back in 1865, Daniel McKendrick, a well-to-do plumber and Scottish immigrant, built a three-story masonry home on the outskirts of New Orleans. Never would he know that the home's location today is the New Orleans Garden District and the center of one of the most comprehensive Greek Revival neighborhoods left standing in this nation. Rescued from demolition and restored to its original beauty by Eddie and Lisa Bro back in 1991, the home features most of its original woodwork plaster archways in those gorgeous ceiling medallions. And y'all, as an added perk for visitors, the home is located directly on Magazine Street, known around the globe as a world-class antique art and collectible shopping district. Ah, oh, what a spot. I'm Chef John Pulse, welcoming you to the McKendrick Bro House and the historic Lower Garden District of New Orleans. This home, y'all, it's a preservationist dream. This beautiful home was skillfully plucked from certain demolition. The building was virtually unrecognizable at the time the bros acquired it in 1992. First, the building had to be braced up with metal ties, completely gutted, and then renovations started from scratch. Special care was taken by local architects to preserve each and every detail of this home. Guests are greeted here in the reception area and immediately begin to witness the preservation theme. This gorgeous stained glass made its way to McKendrick Bro through the family and complements the unique light fixtures located throughout. The fixtures were designed by historical lighting manufacturer Guy Wilson. Located just four blocks from St. Charles Avenue, this B&B offers an array of sights and sounds and tours of the New Orleans Garden District. These elaborate archways and medallions were restored to their original grandeur due to a conversation the bros had with past owner, Sister Marie Condone, who lived here from 1907 to 1933. Wouldn't y'all love to have this little staircase in your home? I know I would. McKendrick Bro features five spacious guest rooms with 12-foot ceilings and clawfoot bathtubs. A night's sleep is further pampered in this exquisite 1880s Victorian walnut bedroom situated on the third floor. And these touch lamps are just another example of Guy Wilson's restoration talent. This glazed oakwood furniture was stripped and reglazed to bring out the natural grain. Once again, Bro's desire to preserve even grandmother's furniture. Additional guest rooms are located directly across the tropical courtyard, which by the way, was once a bar. These modern suites and fixtures are truly inviting to visitors, and in short, y'all, you want for nothing else if you choose to spend an evening here at McKendrick Bro House in the Lower Garden District of New Orleans. Y'all, every time I walk into the McKendrick Bro House, I realize what a visionary that Eddie Bro must have been when he walked up in front of that home and saw the completed project. Remember, that home was boarded up for 25 years on Magazine Street, and he had to look at this and say, 
I see a gorgeous B&B &B here. And to think that all of the medallions and all of that gorgeous plaster work was still intact there. Of course, you can imagine what the rest of the house looked like. Uh, that was a miracle as well. And even though the home's located right in the heart of the uh, antique district and the art district of New Orleans, it's also only about six or seven blocks from the farmer's market, y'all, the Crescent City Farmer's Market. And if you're a cook and you're like me, you're going to go to the farmer's market before you go to the antique stores. And I want you to take a look at this basket of gorgeous melaton that I have here because this is the premier vegetable of early New Orleans. And it's uh, known to some of you as chayote squash. And I have some on my platter here, so I want you to take a look at it because this is one of the dishes that's, uh, uh, that McKendrick uh, Bro features. And the melaton is Kind of, well, I guess we call it the vegetable pear, some of you. The, the uh, early colonists brought this in uh, from the Canary Islands. The Spanish brought it in and planted it here. And it's actually about as hard as a rock, y'all, almost like an apple or a pear. And there's this seed right in the middle that has to come out once it's cooked. But uh, the melitons are split in half and uh, then put into a pot of boiling water. And take a look at these, uh, that's, uh, the ones that's simmering here. I have them right in here, nice and tender. When they become fork tender, then you pull that seed out and scoop the meat out of the melaton, and then you're ready to cook them. And of course, in Louisiana, we cook them uh, and serve them in a couple of different fashions. But let's go ahead and cook some, and then I'll tell you a little bit about the different uh, methods or uses uh, for the melaton. The first thing we want to do is to saute a group of vegetables here. Oh, let me get this fire down a little bit. I'm going to saute my onion, celery, bell pepper, because even though, again, that this is a vegetable, it is also an entree in Louisiana. We love to serve vegetables stuffed with different seafoods as uh, an entree. So I'm going to go ahead and saute my onion, celery, colored bell peppers, and then I'm going to put a little touch of garlic in here, y'all. And then I want to show you the seafoods that I'm going to put inside of this stuffing because even though we can stuff it with ground beef or ground pork in Louisiana we love to stuff melaton or eggplant uh, any squash actually with uh, crab meat so let me take a look at this plat here let's take a look at some of the shrimp and crab we have here I have some nice little tiny shrimp this is about a 70 90 these are the uh, white shrimp of the Gulf of Mexico and then we peel the smaller versions and I'm gonna put them in and this is the claw crab meat y'all the more flavorful of the crab meat the jumbo lump is right next to it and I garnish the melaton with that but I love the claw crab meat as a flavoring. So let's throw the claw crab meat into the skillet right there, and then of course my shrimp right down into that uh, little pan, and I'll stir that around and get this really going nicely. And you just want to wilt the vegetables as well as the shrimp and crab. You want to heat them all the way through because this dish will be baked, y'all. We I want it stuffed. We're going to go ahead and uh, uh, and bake them. So once the uh, uh, Canary Islanders bought this chayote squash, or the melaton, as the French call them, uh, into the city of New Orleans, they planted these vines all over the city, and then eventually they worked their way out into the rural areas of Louisiana, and of course we find them on every holiday table. You, you cannot eat uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter without getting into melaton here in Louisiana. Okay, y'all, so now that that's all done, I'm going to throw my uh, melaton, take a look at this. This is nice and tender. Remember, this has been baked, uh, this has been boiled already, so it's nice and tender. So we're gonna mix this in with all of the seasonings. I think you get the idea here about just how flavorful this is gonna be. And once this has all come together, I'm gonna let this cook for a fair amount of time, probably about 30 minutes, but I'm gonna season it here now, y'all, with a little, I'm going to put some Creole seasoning in because I really love Creole seasoning, that good blend of flavor. I'm going to put some thyme and basil, the two most important herbs in Louisiana's Creole cuisine. I'm going to put that around in there. And of course, a little salt and pepper. Remember, the Creole seasoning has a little bit spice in it, but salt and pepper is what you want to put into it like that. And then go ahead again and mix it around and blend it well. And you may want to put some of the poaching liquid from the melaton that you, uh, that you actually poach the melaton into this skillet to keep it nice and, mo nice and moist during the cooking process because you want this to cook all the way down 
into a nice uh, blended stuffing. You don't want any chunky pieces. You want it all nice and blended. So y'all, once this is cooked, and as I say, it'll take about 30 minutes, I want you to come back to my platter here because I want you to take a look at this. The melaton are now uh, taken and stuffed with the uh, stuffing once it's uh, chilled, and then we put a little breadcrumbs on top of it, and then into a 350 degree oven, and we bake them for about 25 or 30 minutes. We serve one as an appetizer or a vegetable, and y'all, about two or three of them as an entree. So you want to make sure that uh, uh, you cook a lot of, of these. They're absolutely fantastic. The taste is a lot like squash, but mm, so flavorful with crab meat and shrimp. Another great dish, y'all, from McKendrick Burrow, and I'm going to Bring this gorgeous platter up here. I love these platters. Take a look at this. This is the ingredients for my second dish, Oysters Dunbar. And Oysters Dunbar is a dish that was created at Korean Dunbar's restaurant in New Orleans many years ago. And the main ingredient, oysters and artichoke, y'all, the globe artichoke. And we use the chopped hearts of the artichoke as the main flavoring. Again, crab meat, if you can imagine that, and oysters go into the dish. Seafood seasoning vegetables. So let's go ahead and uh, whip up a batch of that nice uh, oysters done bar because again this is a stuffing y'all. This is a stuffing. I guess you can eat it as a casserole. It would be a, a great casserole as well. Kick this fire way high here on my skillet. Again same technique. A lot of vegetables in our vegetable cooking. Onion, celery, bell pepper again. And you notice that I use a lot of red and yellow bell peppers. Well, whenever we're creating stuffings in Louisiana, we want to make sure that the stuffings have a lot of color because after all, they're going to stand on their own. So you want them to uh, literally stand out and uh, be very colorful, very eye appealing. And the oysters done bar is certainly no different. So I've sauteed my onion, celery, bell pepper as I did with the meliton or chayote, uh, chayote squash. And then into that, my chopped artichoke hearts. Now I'm gonna throw those artichoke hearts down in there and y'all, the oysters. I'm gonna throw, look at that, oysters and oyster liquid. And you know, in the old days, we used to say that you couldn't eat oysters in any month that didn't have an R in it, uh, or, or that had an R in it, like, um, uh, because, uh, uh, because of the heat, the, you had to, the July, August, September months, uh, you could, uh, uh, you could eat, uh, you couldn't eat oysters. Boy, am I, am I confusing you with that? I'm confusing myself. Any month that didn't have an R in it, you couldn't eat doggone oysters, <laughs> okay? Uh, but that was because of no refrigeration, y'all. So today, of course, hey, forget about it. Eat oysters whenever you get them from a good, reputable supplier. Okay, now that the artichoke hearts are cooking nicely in here with the oysters and that great oyster liquid is starting to come together, now I'm going to put in a little flour, y'all. I need to make a roux, and I'm going to make a basic white sauce here. I'm going to stir this around for just a second to pick up that liquid in the butter, and you can see how that flour is coming together nicely to make a white roux. And then, y'all, a little bit heavy whipping cream, if you can imagine that, to make a bechamel or a white sauce. And just enough to hold all of this together. Remember, that's all we're trying to do is to create a stuffing for those beautiful American species oysters that we find so much of in New Orleans. Now, once all of this, look how that's coming together. Isn't that beautiful? Now, I would put some of my seasoning in here again. Of course, again, a little Creole seasoning. Put some in. A little salt and pepper again. And let your, uh, let your own taste guide exactly how much salt and pepper. A little Worcestershire sauce is really nice in here. A couple little dashes. And then herbs and spices again, as I tell you. Basil, thyme, a little oregano too, y'all, is really uh, good in here. And you just want to kind of stir that around. And to finish it, then we just throw in a few little breadcrumbs to tighten it all up. Even though the bechamel is already uh, tightening up the oysters pretty good, we still want to go ahead and do this. Now, y'all, this becomes the stuffing for the oysters. And then you would take one of these nice oyster shells that I have on my platter here, and I want to stuff one for you just to show you exactly how it's done. You just take some of this really nice, oh, this is so fantastic, right on top of the oyster, just like this. And I know you have, I mean, you can picture this flavor, right? I know you can. It's so flavorful. Then a little bit breadcrumbs right on top of the oyster, y'all, 350-degree oven. 
again, 350 degree oven for about 15 minutes to brown the bread crumbs. And can you imagine how delicious these are, how gorgeous these are? And again, three or four is an appetizer. Put six on the plate, y'all. You're gonna have a fantastic entree and an entree developed at one of the greatest restaurants in New Orleans, Korean Dunbar. And Unfortunately, she's not open anymore, but you can recreate the recipe. Now, y'all talking about a recipe, Eddie Bro was good enough to share with me one of the greatest recipes from the Kendrick Bro House, and that is his Annie's Cookies. That's right, Annie's Cookies, an unbelievable flavor, and also at the same time, share some of his thoughts on renovating that home. Let's go to the kitchen. Hey, so Eddie, there you are. Hey, John, how are you? Oh, just great. You know, around every nook and cranny in this house is another surprise. What a fabulous place. It's a great place. I like it a lot. I see you don't need another chef in the kitchen, huh? No, I'm whipping up some of these great Anise cookies that you like so much and that the uh, guests like so much. Oh, I tell you, I love these cookies. They're one of the best, in fact, I've ever eaten. And I have to tell you, I eat them here first. What have you done so far? Well, six eggs, um, three cups of sugar, Beat them together for 30 minutes, John. 30 <laughs> full minutes. Yeah, I hear you saying 30 full minutes because the first time you told me 30 minutes, I said, ah, he probably meant 15. And of course, you know, I ruined about seven dozen eggs. <laughs> seven dozen eggs. Unbelievable. <laughs> well, once we do this, we'll add, we add uh, four cups of flour. Right. And then the next thing we have to add there is just an ease, and that's it. Oh, good. So would you like to add that for me? Yeah, I know you want to keep this Andes flavor off of your hands, huh? This is about one teaspoon of anise, and this is going to give it that really nice uh, licorice flavor that's going to give it that wonderful uh, uh, parno, that herb saint flavor of, uh, of early New Orleans. And, uh, and it has almost as much a, an aromatics as a flavor to it. Absolutely. And you know, this batter can sit here for a full hour without doing anything to it. Is that right? Um, yeah, absolutely. And um, before we put it, even put it into the oven. So you have some already baking. I can smell that great aroma. Absolutely. You want to take a look at them? Well, I tell you what. First of all, I want to talk about that stove because you were telling me this is your grandmother's uh, range. As I told you, that's my grandmother's range that she gave to me. And it was in that condition. It's a 1952 Chambers range. I tell you, they just don't make baking stoves the way they used to uh, make them back then. Let's it's take a look at those not. cookies. Sure, let's. Ah, oh, look at that. Oh, just absolutely fantastic, great. beautiful. Look at the uh, quality of that baking. You know, Eddie, the only thing better than the aroma of those great cookies would be to have a couple of them served on that fantastic oak table over there. Of course, in a couple of those beautiful depression plates and that nice depression uh, cookie jar with a good cup of coffee. Uh, well, why don't we walk <laughs> over there and do that? That'd be great. Let's Perfect. do it. Good. Eddie, this really is a fantastic cookie. What's the origin of this recipe anyway? These cookies uh, go back quite a bit, actually. The, uh, we had the fortune, the good fortune of meeting uh, some of the sisters that lived in this house back in 1903 to 1930. And one of the things she remembered most about the house was the, the aroma of these cookies baking when her grandmother would bake them for them as a child. Well, that's definitely one of the uh, traits of this cookie is the fantastic aroma of that anise. It's a, it's a fantastic recipe. Um, one of the things I, I notice as I walk around the house, in addition to all the great architectural detail in that wonderful chamber's uh, uh, stove, is the chandeliers, they're so unique. Are they original to the house? No, John, they're not original. Actually, those are recreations, but uh, the elements that were used to design them or to construct them were picked from you know, a, a massive catalog to select the right elements that would have been in here. Uh, and they were done right here in New Orleans. I met a wonderful craftsman that uh, I'd like to introduce you to, actually, at some point. Don't, don't leave without me giving you his name. Oh, great, yeah, because I really think they're some of the best uh, I've ever seen, some of the best work I've ever seen. Uh, Eddie, this area of New Orleans, this part of Magazine Street, wasn't always considered prime real estate, was it? No, not at all. It was quite blighted and, and uh, an urban blight, for sure. Uh, it's, it's considered the lower part of Magazine Street, and there was a time, maybe as, as soon as five years ago, where there were a lot of boarded up properties. So, so y'all came in and actually picked up one of the properties. Were you one of the first uh, uh, people to get involved in renovation we here? Were, we were within the first batch that came through here. They were considered at the time as being pioneers. Now, what, what was your motivation? It had to be just a, uh, in everybody else's mind a tremendous risk to come here. It was, and, and people told us that over and over again. Uh, but you look at these houses, and they just don't have this housing stock anywhere else. 
Well, I tell you, once you walk through the finished property, you realize that the risk was the least thing to worry about. It absolutely turned out to be magnificent. Now, you, like many other people uh, uh, in corporate America, uh, corporate sales, corporate management, decided to make a move a couple of years ago, and now you're an innkeeper. What was that transition like? It was a great transition, actually. It puts me a little bit more in control of my life. I have more time to spend with my son. But mainly, I can share the city, this architecture with people that, uh, you know, from all over the world. Uh, who are your guests? My, my guests come from all over. Uh, they're wonderful people of all makes and um, of all nationalities. Well, I tell you, it's a, it's a fantastic place. I want to thank you so much for allowing us to spend the day here with you, and uh, I guarantee you I will be back. Well, thank you, John. It was a pleasure having you, and please come back and see me. And remember, my doors are always open, and there's no place as, as nice as Magazine Street to stay when you're in New Orleans. Y'all, Eddie has a passion for that home, but I tell you what, I have a passion for those Andes cookies. They're absolutely incredible. And of course, this is a, a, a flavor of the Mediterranean that came to New Orleans in the very early days, and it's no wonder we find them in these uh, uh, cookies. I want you to take a look at a couple of other great dishes that we found at McKendrick Bro. First of all, y'all, this little uh, spice coffee cake. I'm going to pour a cup of coffee while you're looking at that coffee cake there. Uh, this is almost, I, I guess I should call this a Creole spice cake. It has pecan, cinnamon, nutmeg, all those wonderful flavors. And then we go ahead and bake this for about 350 degrees. And it's a great morning breakfast dish. And take a look at this gorgeous terrine, y'all. Mm, mm, mm. This is my basil and sun-dried tomato stuffed chicken. And then it's grilled. We marinate it in olive oil and uh, Worcestershire sauce and all these different herbs and spices and then right into the uh, grill. Now, y'all, uh, you heard about this lighting manufacturer? I got a chance to go to his shop and you come along with me. It was great. Hey, Guy, how are you doing? Hey, John, good hey, to see you. Nice to see you. They say beware of uh, visitors bearing gifts, but I had to bring you some of those Andes cookies from oh, the McKendrick Brown House. That's my huh? favorite. Oh, my I favorite too. That. I love those things. Thank I you. eat too many of them. How you doing? Guy, how does somebody one day wake up and say, hey, I want to be in the lamp restoration and design business? Well, uh, I don't think it actually happens like that, but <laughs> uh, when I got into it, I've always appreciated uh, fine craftsmanship, and um, I also enjoyed restoring things, furniture, houses, whatever it may be. And um, I decided to build a house and looked for old fixtures and had a hard time finding sources uh, for those fixtures and decided to take it upon myself to, to do that. Well, you know, I was <clears throat> so impressed when I walk in the, walked in the McKendrick Burrow House and saw the fixtures that you had designed and worked on. Uh, I thought to myself, my God, this had to be so difficult. What were the challenges there? Well, for example, this, uh, this, this is one of the fixtures that we found originally in the, in the, uh, the McKendrick Brew House. And uh, to reproduce this, this cast piece would have been very costly to have it founded. Uh, so we decided to uh, go with other options where we, we have commercially available uh, components that uh, you can incorporate in, in the light fixtures. And uh, we decided to take that route because it was the most economical way to go. We also found some other fixtures in that house that uh, we modeled our uh, fixtures that we made after. Now, you know, I have an antique fixture that I found in my attic. It's got a kind of a broken shade on it. And I, uh, and I thought I might have it restored, but at the same time, maybe have another one made. What's the process that I would go through here at the shop? Well, you would, you would bring the fixture in, and we would uh, look and, and see if we could find commercially available parts. If we couldn't, we would uh, outsource the uh, uh, parts that needed to be made uh, as, as far as castings. So the sky's the limit. I'll bring it in, we kind of draw it out and look at it, and if I have the money, you can make it exactly, happen. Exactly, <laughs> right. Do you prefer restoration of fixtures, or do you rather do your I own? I really like restorations a whole lot, um, but uh, uh, we do uh, do our own designs. We uh, do reproductions of, uh, of gas lights that uh, were, were found in you know, earlier times. Uh, this is one of them we make out of copper from, from scratch. We, uh, we use uh, sheet copper and, and cut, it, cut out patterns and, and make each individual piece ourselves in our shop uh, and, and put these fixtures yeah. together. Very, very, very nice. Now, 
What makes your fixtures different? I can go into any store in America and buy a light fixture. Why would I want to buy yours? Well, I, I personally have to say the craftsmanship is, is there. You, you don't find craftsmanship like this in mass-produced products. It's, uh, the finishes are all hand done. Uh, they're not machine done. Yeah. And the uniqueness of them are just really fantastic. I would definitely want to get yours. And talking about that, I'm getting ready to build a brand new country French house in Gonzales, and I'm going to have some lighting uh, challenges. Uh, you think you might be able to help me there? It's only a matter of budget, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Thanks a lot, Guy. Okay, I appreciate thank it. You. And thank all of you for dropping by as we continue to visit the bed and breakfasts of the Bayou State and cook up more great taste of Louisiana. Budget, huh? What, what about this little number? I mean, you know, I mean, it's like this. To learn more about A Taste of Louisiana with Chef John Folson Company, visit PBS online at the internet address on your screen. Hot beignets and warm boudoirs by Chef John Folson is available for $29.95. This companion book to the series features over 150 recipes. To order, call 1 800 973 7246 or write to the address on your screen. Major funding for A Taste of Louisiana with John Fultz and Company is made possible in part by Zatarain's authentic New Orleans style dinner mixes. Zatarain's, a good way to jazz up dinner and a real New Orleans original since 1889. Louisiana. She's the exception and never the rule. She's a mystery that asks not to be solved, but simply to be experienced. Louisiana, Louisiana where you can come as you are and leave different. Additional funding is provided by the Friends of Louisiana Public Broadcasting and the Foundation for Excellence in Louisiana Public Broadcasting.